it's, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here with uh, Graphisoft. I've been waiting for this for, for 20 years. Uh, our office, had, we're early adopters of the software. And uh, when we just started the firm, uh, one of my friends from, actually from high school, I, I went to an architecture program one summer, and he said, he started selling ArchiCAD, and he said, you guys have to use this, it's gonna change your, your business. Well, we didn't really have much of a business then anyway, so we just said, let's do it. And uh, so we've been using it for, for 20 years, and uh, actually the director of our Swiss office is here as well, and he's been using it as well for that long. So I'm gonna show you some things. Everything has been done with ArchiCAD. Um, much of it has been done with Rhino uh, as well, uh, because we're using the software uh, to model things in a sort of very interesting way. Uh, but most importantly for us, um, architecture is about connecting. It's about connecting to the environment. It's about connecting with each other. And we are the most connected species to ever live on the planet, but yet we're also the most disconnected. We're always other places. So the architecture that we do tries to help people reconnect with the world around them and reconnect with each other. And, you know, this idea that we're sort of getting further and further away from nature is something that concerns us greatly. So while we use a lot of technology and, and other things, you know, everything we do you know, really comes from the heart. Um, and it's really about helping us get back in touch with nature because you know, nature is to me the, the, the most beautiful thing and, and our work is really not about the architecture itself but how the architecture could be more submissive and nature can be the star. So here you can see Angkor Wat uh, a little bit taken over by nature, but this is what inspires us because we did live in a paradise and we're getting further and further away from that. So if our work could help us to, to get closer, uh, we believe that we've been successful. Um, the work is really about focusing, focusing on the beauty of what's around us that we take for granted the flora, the fauna, the mist, the sky, the light of the sun, the reflections of the water. And we're always trying to get very connected to the place that we're working in. We call it the, the spirit of place. And, you know, everywhere we work, we're always working with the local material, the local stone. We really look in a way that primitive societies began to, to how they had no choice but to, to live, where they used everything around them. So this is a project that in Costa Rica. It's sort of hidden in the mist, but when the mist clears, you can see it. Uh, the idea is that it, it's, it's one with the land. It's building with the land. It's, it, the, the shape of the building is always derived by something for us. It's never just an arbitrary form. So in this case, it follows the fluidity uh, of the landscape. And the building is meant to disappear, but yet create these incredibly heightened experiences. So this is really the only building that's visible. And we worked around all the existing trees on the site to create this moment where you're very hyper-connected to, to the water, to the sky, to the light. The sunrise and the sunset become special moments within the journey of the architecture. And this is really set up in that way, similar to the way primitive societies built. They, they really lined up buildings with the path of the sun and the moon. And here the architecture becomes incredibly reductive, but essential. You can see some of the existing landscaping, but the forms of the earth and the topography of the earth really dictate to us how we build and where we build. So we're always really listening very carefully to the land. And the first thing we're doing is modeling all these things in the computer. We first of all go to the site. We try to understand it. We like to spend time on the site, sometimes camping out there, for days, watching the path of the sun, feeling the wind, you know, similar to the way like a native tribes used to go to a place to, to feel it out. So we really try to get very in tune with the surroundings and then create the most sort of minimal yet amplified version uh, of the project where it really becomes about capturing and framing views. Uh, this is a project that we have under construction in Bali. It's a recreation, if you will, of a, a, of a Balinese landscape. It's a rice fields that become inhabitable. So for us, we, we want to create more nature. We want to create more 
landscape. We want to let the buildings become more recessive and, and disappear. Similar to the way animals cloak themselves in their environment, this idea of camouflage. So we're using the local stone here, which is right under the earth, uh, and, and recreating and reconstituting these landscapes. But it's always about heightening the, the experience and the connectivity to the place. So here you can see the terrace pools and gardens. And it's really about creating the most optimal way to experience the site. On a project in the Bahamas, we let all the native vegetation permeate through this structure and let the jungle sort of take over the building. We're also drawing from the notions of the local traditions, the way that they built on this island for hundreds of years, so with sunscreens and deep overhangs. And the house actually creates the most optimal environment not by technology, but by just logic and sensitivity to the site, the way the house mitigates the breeze and the way that it blends in with its surroundings. We didn't want to create a spaceship here uh, because this is an island that's been inhabited for 400 years in the Bahamas. It was actually the capital of the Bahamas. We wanted the house to feel like it was something that's been there for hundreds of years, but evidently it's, it's not. But it's hidden. It's, it's kind of blending into the landscape, blending into the local vernacular, really expressing the spirit of that place, using the local materials that have been used for hundreds of years, also the techniques that have been used, proven time and time again without technology, without air conditioning. Of course, there is air conditioning, but most of the house is actually on air conditioned for all the time, more or less, except when it's not in use when the windows are closed. So there's sliding glass walls that connect that. And you can see at night how it really creates this incredible atmosphere and you're framing always the sky, the jungle, the way that it's really about capturing shadows and light. One uh, very famous art collector in Miami was like, well, where's the art? You know, I don't see a play, I don't see any of the art. I'm like, well, you know, that's the art. That's what we're trying to help people see is the jungle is the sky. Um, I'm very inspired by the work of James Terrell, an artist who has these incredible sky windows. So here the architecture is reduced down to its essence and the sky really becomes what's important with nothing to distract it. And here you can see the moon lined up on the equinox. Uh, no Photoshop in any of these actually. So that's actually the, the moon lining up perfectly centered uh, on the equinox. And it really, it's not about the architecture. It's about what the architecture could help you see, what the architecture could help you connect with in a new way. And the house really becomes a way to see the site and see the way the place changes, uh, whether it be rainy or sunny, the sunrise. These moments become more important than they were before without the house. And really, ultimately, you're about the place. You travel around the world. Design, in a way, has become homogenized. So we're trying to go backwards and get a little bit more into a primitive mindset. Um, this is a house that we did in a more urban condition. Uh, this is um, for the movie director, Michael Bay, who likes to blow things up and uh, really creates tremendous spectacle. And another artist that I've always been very fond of is Donald Judd. And Donald Judd's work is, is really the, the essence of a, of a space, of a volume. He's re reduced it down to only what's essential. And that's what we try to do in the work. And these frames become, in a way, scaleless and very, very powerful how they frame the landscape. So this is, um, Michael really liked um, that kind of philosophy. So he's like, I want two of those things, one for his master bedroom. Uh, where we begin to really heighten the experience of connectivity to the city beyond. Uh, it was kind of fun. The, he had a birthday party to warm up the house, and I had the opportunity to tour um, not only him, but Steven Spielberg and uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, many of the Hollywood bigwigs who created all these movies that I really loved as a, as a child and still do today. And it was really great to hear Steven Spielberg, like, you know, his jaw drop when he went into, into this bedroom. So it was really a, a great experience. But the house really is very silent. Many of our clients are, live in very highly stressed worlds. Their businesses are incredibly demanding. So we always try to create a very serene environment for them to exist in. So it's the materials, it's the textures, 
you know, we're dealing with notions that are probably more aligned with classical architecture than contemporary architecture. As you can see, even in this moment, there's a courtyard that's there's created the sense of procession that enters to the house. And then you have sort of an, a piazza in the middle where you can go from very different places of the house. There's this really beautiful room downstairs that is the pool cabana. And Michael wanted to have some sloped glass, so we found a moment uh, in the project. And he wanted the window to operate, which was kind of a challenge because the window is about 15 meters wide uh, by about 10 meters, well, maybe less, maybe about um, 7 meters long. And we needed to operate it, so it kind of moves like this, uh, which is quite exciting. Uh, and scary at the same time because he wanted his people who did his props and sets to build the window. And they never built anything architectural before, and uh, they did an actually incredible job. But the idea is really to create an infrastructure for life. That's what we're doing. We're crafting these moments. We're creating and thinking about the experiences of how architecture can enhance people's lives. And really adapt to the place and celebrate the place. So here's a view of sort of the quintessential LA uh, from above. Uh, that's actually one of the Pritzker's homes down below. So I don't know that'll help us ever with a Pritzker prize, but uh, we're looking down on him. Uh, but you know, it was, it was really an incredible project. Uh, all this was done in Archicad, which allowed us to change the house uh, infinitely because Michael would one day wake up and say, I want the room 10 meters, the next day he would say 15, and we were pouring concrete, and so it was uh, great to have a very integrated model on the building. Uh, I was allowed to stay at the house once. Uh, Michael always said that I could stay there, and I actually, but he only allowed me to stay once, but, and I caught this picture. Uh, in the morning, I woke up and was photographing everything uh, and captured this picture, and I think this picture really speaks about the essence of what we're trying to do. You know, you're floating in the, in the sky between the landscape, and it's really a, a, a beautiful heightened experience. And this is the pool that sort of cascades down these stairs. Um, a friend of Michael's, a uh, very famous furniture designer, owner of a lot of showrooms, a woman by the name of Holly Hunt, uh, went to Michael's house, and she was working on um, a project for herself in, in the mountains. And she wanted something really special, and she'd been working with all different architects from around the world. Uh, none of them have used Archicad, so that's how we won this competition. And um, we ended up uh, getting this project, and our idea was actually to create something that's always a part, of the, a part of the landscape, and let the spaces and the sequence and the sort of logic guide us, never to do arbitrary form, I mean, even though we're using all the, the Rhino and the, the incredible modeling software and, and the power of that, we, we really never try to let that generate anything. It's, it's really kind of from camping out on the site. We spent uh, a night, actually my family was, was with me, camping out on the site, really understanding the rocks that are there and everything is sort of built of that. So here you can see the sort of entry sequence. I had actually lived in Japan uh, after I graduated on a fellowship. so. Japanese gardens and the way Japanese architecture frames and sets up relationships with nature is something very, very important to me as well. And really, it's about how this project creates the most pleasurable environment and how it helps you see the place that surrounds you. Here is the entry uh, sort of atrium. There's always sort of a, a circulation system that becomes very clear and allows you to go to different parts of the house. And then creating the center of the home becomes this hearth, the fire, and that really becomes a, a very powerful moment within this mountain home. Uh, we like to do a lot of work in, in crazy locations. Uh, this is one of the, the wildest that we have. This is um, three hours north of Doha. Uh, we were asked by uh, the Royal Highness, um, Sheikh Musa to do a destination spa three hours north of Doha, that would be a, a global destination for wellness and research, and uh, which was interesting because it was, not many people really want to go to Doha, let alone three hours north. Uh, so we had to really dive deep and create something 
uh, powerful for her. So this was the, the project. It's sort of the entire peninsula. Uh, these are the research facilities that exist. They're burrowed in the ground. Uh, I watched a lot of Star Wars as a kid, so there's a lot of references of Star Wars films and James Bond films, and uh, always the, the bad guys have these incredible houses, so, but these are good guys, so they have cool houses too. Uh, but all that you see when you're in the desert, we don't want to alter the landscape. We're always about how can we make the landscape be the star, so we wouldn't want to alter it. So here we're, we're kind of celebrating it. We flooded the interior just by opening up a little um, channel so the entire inner valley becomes flooded with water. And this is the experience. It's something that you would never find anywhere. It's sort of this otherworldly experience. It's the idea that the building is almost invisible from the outside unless you're hovering. But it, it, it disappears except for that little entry point. But it's incredibly monumental. So we call this idea silent monumentality. The idea that something could be incredibly powerful, incredibly moving, but yet also nearly invisible. And here you can see just kind of that heightened experience of floating between the clouds and the sea. Uh, the centerpiece of this is this um, spa, which is inspired by the scale of, of Roman baths. I had the opportunity to live in Rome uh, as a student. Uh, but with the sort of mystical quality of, of the Turkish baths, the light and the sort of atmospheric qualities of that. Uh, and it's really a, almost in a way like a sundial. So the passage of the sun allows you to understand the space. And here you can see or barely see this sort of floating object uh, that rests delicately on the dune. We did not want to alter the landscape at all, but really focus on the place as it exists today and celebrate its uniqueness. Another project that we've been working on for many years is, it's not on Mars, but it's close. They filmed the movie The Martian uh, here, and they didn't actually use any special effects to alter the landscape. Uh, this is the Jordan, uh, this is the, the desert of Wadi Rum in Jordan. Uh, our client over eight years assembled basically this area. Those cliffs are up to um, 200 meters. And it takes about hours to, to walk around. But when you, when you get a site like this, you, for me, it's, it's, you can't create anything that will even compare to the, you know, the natural beauty of, of what's there. So we really wanted to focus on you know, how could we, instead of building on the land, how could we build more with the land? And how can we use what's there and almost make it invisible? And that was really our focus. We're also do a tremendous amount of, of research uh, on the, the site, uh, understanding wind patterns and sun patterns, and we camped out here uh, for a good amount of time. Uh, and we got very close to the Bedouin people, sometimes a little too close. We had a, a little bit of a run, and this guy took a fancy to me, and we didn't want to insult him, so uh, he actually offered me some, after licking his fingers with the, the food, he gave me some food, and. I, I couldn't turn it down, so uh, we became very good friends. Uh, but you got to do what it takes to, to get these projects done. Um, you know, this is actually um, um, a model that was, was done in Rhino, but then put into some gaming software. Uh, we've been using a lot of gaming uh, software. Because we're dealing so much with atmosphere and landscape, um, this was actually done in, in CryEngine, which is not what I would recommend, just because at the time it was let us, uh, they let us use the software, but there are many great things happening in gaming software. But very important is really what was there on the site. So this is Petra. It's about 45 minutes from the site. And for me, this was all that we ever wanted to do, is to really create something as beautiful and, and as powerful as this, uh, which was really more about subtracting things rather than adding things, about bringing things into the site. We weren't we didn't want to bring things that we wanted to limit what we brought into the site and let the site really provide the opportunity of how we can create these incredible architectural experiences. Uh, I draw a lot from artists, probably more than architects. And one of the art artists that I've always been fascinated with is Michael Heitzer, the way that he uses landscape to, to create and heighten these experiences. So this is his project, Double Negative, and how he's using these moments to uh, really create uh, this idea of, of land art. So the arrival area becomes 
this, this moment that frames the landscape. We, we hope that these landscapes are even more powerful when they're kind of within the architecture that, that we're establishing. And everything that's here is actually mixed with the sand and the rock. So this is a cement that's basically built with the mineralization of the, the earth that's there, similar to the way that the rock was formed. So it, it becomes one. This is where you get on your camel. And it's really nestled in here. The forms are, are very simple, very primitive. This is actually just a very simple courtyard. But the experiences are very heightened. We also wanted to utilize technology that the Bedouin people have implemented for 5,000 plus years. They, they actually use the hair of the goat to weave these tents, which is actually incredibly well thought out, not only because it's one of the only materials that they have there, but it's sustainable. They don't kill the goats for that. But it's actually amazing because the sun allows the wind, you know, it's a black, which is interesting, very dark, but it allows the sun to be blocked and the wind to permeate. And when it rains, which it actually does rain and it rains hard, the goat hair expands, therefore creating a, a sort of impenetrable membrane with very simple technology. Uh, but you can see here that the building is invisible. And only at night you can see the glow of candles. We actually insisted that no power would be used. So all the lighting at night is with candles. There's no um, conditioned space, no technology. We wanted to really connect people to the place. There's incredible silence. And it's amazing what we can see and experience today once we disconnect. Because when we're always connected to everyone else and the whole world, we really lose track of, of where we are and, and the presence of, of where we are. So this is more about disconnecting to reconnect, reconnect with each other, reconnect to the place. And it's really our, our, our goal to to do this wherever we can and, and work all around the world you know, with this mission. So here you can see the actually spa, the, the baths. Uh, we're collecting water through, you know, thousands of year old technology of using channels carved into the rock that fill up cisterns. So it's, it's actually something, you know, there, you don't expect water in the desert, but here you can actually find these incredible moments. And then those water cisterns become experiential chambers to appreciate uh, this light and, and the rock. Uh, we're working on another project nearby uh, in a sort of heated zone. Uh, this is also in Jordan. Uh, but to that side is, is Israel, uh, over here is uh, Egypt, and then just over there is Saudi Arabia. So it's a very kind of heated area. Our project is actually right on the, you can throw a stone into Israel, which I wouldn't recommend. Those guys like to shoot people throwing stones, so I, I wouldn't do that. But uh, our project is, is very close uh, to Israel. And we actually were asked to do a clubhouse uh, this is the largest project in Jordan. We only were doing a small portion. And the client wanted something um, iconic. I, I get very scared when I hear that, that word. Um, but, you know, not, nevertheless, we tried to do something that would be silent, but yet monumental, or in her words, I iconic. And we got to the site and we found this. And we're like, that's it, we're done. Our job is, is done. Uh, we wanted to occupy these, these dunes, and, well, it took a little longer than just that. So here you can begin to, to see the sort of um, incredible amount of engineering and other things that went into this, uh, utilizing uh, the various software uh, programs. And everything here was, was done with Rhino and, and Archicad. Uh, but it was quite interesting because we had to do it in a very primitive way. We only had one piece of equipment, and everything else was done by hand by local Bedouin people with the, the training of our, our Swiss engineers and our Swiss um, shotcrete team. So this is actually a building that becomes an occupiable dune. There's very little, well, actually, the skin is, creates space as well as becomes the structure. So this is how it exists, and it becomes this incredibly silent moment within the landscape, mimicking the, the valley that it exists within. But yet the experiences are incredibly heightened. And all this was done with very little uh, um, skilled labor. In fact, very little. The, the tribal people actually had never worked in this method before. But it was also done incredibly 
economically, and, and the effect is something that is incredibly rich and incredibly tactile. It's not meant to be perfect. Actually, the minerals of the earth are there and present, so you get a lot of different colors and different experiences. But it's really about how this place can connect you know, as powerfully as possible with the landscape, as well as allowing the landscape to sort of permeate through and create this incredible atmosphere where breezes and, and the, the, the overall feeling is something that we're trying to do. We're not like designing for only the eyes, we're, we're designing for all the senses. And we really think about those very ephemeral things like, like feeling, like what feels good. And I spent a lot of time going around and seeing architecture around the world. And I think sometimes there's great architecture that doesn't really feel that good. There's maybe bad architecture that sometimes feels good. We want to do great architecture that feels good. So it's something that's very important to us. Um, equally important to us is what's happening in the planet in terms of water. Uh, scary, but this image, the large sphere, is actually all the water that exists on our planet. Um, it's a, a, a sphere, so it's a multi-dimensional object, and it's actually um, 750 miles in uh, diameter, so don't get too nervous. Uh, the other, the smaller one is actually the, the drinking water that exists on, on our planet. So uh, we were asked by um, the city of Basel to, in Switzerland, to create uh, an infrastructure project which would take the water from the Rhine River and convert it into drinking water. And this project existed on the edge of the forest next to the industrial zone. And we're actually using the forest as part of the filtration system. So our job was to create a sort of box for this technology. And we had a hard time sort of figuring out what that could be. So we began to kind of come up with a logic of what that would mean. Like, okay, it's a box. Well, it could be glass, it could be stone. It would ha we had actually no budget. So we couldn't do many of the things that we were thinking about. So we began to see like, well, what if we like, begin to suck out the air in the project and make the design about creating the most sort of volumetrically efficient space. And then we sort of went and studied with modeling software, Rhino, and bringing that back into ARCHICAD and studying these ways of, of making the forces become the sort of understanding of the space. Um, that, that seemed a little bit disconnected for us. We needed to understand what that would mean for material purposes. So we began to study, you know, what water, what were the, the earliest vessels that held water? And we came to the notion of clay, that clay pots were the ones that, that began to hold water. So uh, Beat, who runs the office in Switzerland, we took bikes and went up into the mountains and actually uh, found clay that existed up behind the office, which is very close to their site. Uh, in Switzerland, so we have an office in Switzerland as in, well as New York and, and in Miami, which is our home base. So this color and this, this texture and the material began to kind of give us clues as to what this, this can be. We went back and we made a model using the computer to guide us of what that form would be. We, we kind of sculpted this little model and then that little model uh, became this, this very large building that exists between the edge of the forest and that exustral zone. And we want it to kind of be both an industrial building, but also sort of a geological artifact. So here you can begin to, to see the building, something very unfamiliar in terms of an industrial building, uh, very much part of the landscape, very much about how it deals with light. The materiality is highly tactile. This um, happens to be the largest a sprayed concrete building in the world. Not was not our intent, but somehow became that. Uh, but it's something that is really part of the forest, uh, more geology uh, than architecture. And little by little, the, the forest will engulf the building. Um, strangely enough, it, it was this beautiful forest that surrounded the building and during construction. And then suddenly one day, we went to the site and all the trees were gone and like, oh, we can't photograph the building anymore. Uh, because in, in Switzerland, they actually uh, use the forest and they clean the forest and make these very high performance forests to gather trees. So maybe in another uh, 15 years, uh, we'll be able to um, see the beauty of, of, of this building. 
all these projects, or some of these projects, uh, we actually had the opportunity to, to put together a book. It's, uh, it's about 20 years in, in the making. Uh, it's called Spirit of Place. And it's really a, a tactile experience uh, of how to understand these projects. And it's a really uh, beautiful addition. Um, and we might have one outside uh, later. But really, I, I hope that um, what I've spoken today has kind of given you a, a new way of, of thinking about how architecture and technology can kind of take a step back and become you know, more close to the heart and to our, to our lives and, and really get in tune with the world around us. So thank you very much.